Hey everyone, it's Saoirse. Did you just spill tea all over your hair like I did? You know, I had an interesting comment on my last video that I wanted to share. Somebody asked me um, if this was a book review channel or a look at my new hairdo channel. And I had to think about that for a while. And I've come to the conclusion that it is neither. So um, if you're looking for reviews or hair, probably go somewhere else because all I do is talk about my thoughts on books and all I do is have hair. So, um, yeah, I just thought that was hilarious. But because you guys know I didn't even mention my hair in that video, but some people are, are salty about me having it on my head. But I do like to talk about books and you know I never presume to tell you like this is this is just simply a good book or this is simply a bad book um, and it isn't just my opinion, this is a fact. No, like I am definitely talking about my own opinions and um, so I don't really like to call them reviews and maybe that's just me being like scared of whatever but I, I would rather just call them thoughts because it is just, you know, kind of like our little book club where I just chat to you and then you can comment and uh, we can just hang out and chill and that's what I want it to be. Just chill. Just chill time. Grab some tea. Hang out with me. And I'm just gonna chat at you. So, those of you who have been around for a while, you, you get it. So today I want to chat at you and with you about A User's Guide to Make Believe by Jane Alexander. So this book was published in 2020. Very recent. You know, I uh, hardly ever get hardcover books and lately I've been like reading through my unread hardcovers. I just find them like difficult to grasp, um, literally, but uh, when it's like a new book, a new release that I'm excited about, of course I'll get the hardcover. So I got this because it was written by my professor, um, Dr. Jane Alexander. She is my dissertation supervisor this summer and she was also my professor for my creative writing classes for the past year at the University of Edinburgh. So, um, of course I was curious to read her book and I also really want to get her first book. This is her second novel. So I um, actually got to go to her book talk type thing with some other local authors. It wasn't her release. Um, I missed that unfortunately, but she had like a book talk with these other authors and this was in March. Um, right before everything started getting cancelled, so I was really glad that I got to go to that. And um, she signed it for me, and it was just really special, you know, because this is somebody who's who I admire and who's been teaching me writing, um, how to improve my writing for the past year. Um, so it's very, very, very cool feeling to get to hold her actual book. To Saoirse, if you like it. I love signed books. Um, so, this book is definitely what I would call science fiction um, or speculative fiction. It has, in my opinion, a very Black Mirror vibe. Um, I will read you the little inside flap here. You create the fantasy. They control your mind. Cassie McAllister worked at Imogen, the tech giant behind the cutting-edge virtual reality experience Make Believe, and she got to know the product far too well. Now Cassie has been blocked from Make Believe and legally gagged by the company. With Imogen holding all the cards and personal and public freedoms at stake, how far will she go to expose their deception? So, yeah, it's, um, it's about virtual reality. And in this book, uh, people experience that through these receivers they can wear on their ear and um, there's also like some other interesting techie biological stuff that I uh, will let you discover for yourself because I don't want to mess it up with my explanation um, but yeah very smart concept and um, interesting idea of the future and I like how um, she she doesn't hit you over the head with any sort of tropes. Um, it's all very cleverly and subtly done. Um, you don't really know what point in the future this is. I don't think it's ever mentioned. Um, you just come to know the main character and um, her 
past struggles that have led to this problem with make-believe and, and why the company is after her. Um, I'm just, I'm like trying not to give things away because you guys know I don't do spoilers usually unless I specifically say I'm gonna do a spoiler but I'm trying not to. Um, but I read this book in like two marathon sessions where I was just like focused, super focused, which is so unusual for me because it's very hard for me to just sit and concentrate on a book and I think that surprises some people because they, you know, see how many books I own and how much I talk about books and they think that I'm like a really fast reader or something. Um, but truthfully, if I'm not, if I'm not so gripped that like I can't even put it down um, because I can't bear to do anything else without finding out what's happening in this book, um, and that's a very rare thing. If that doesn't happen, then I'm pretty slow. Um, and I have to, you know, put my phone in the other room. I have to... I have to do a lot of things, like really set myself up so that I can concentrate. Um, I get distracted very easily. Which reminds me, where are my cats right now? They're just like hanging out in the bedroom. I don't know why they're not in here. Okay, so I'm gonna read like just a few things little lines that I liked in this book. It was a risk, of course. Perhaps that was what made it irresistible. Or it was her curiosity about him. Or else it was simpler than all of that. She had started to share her story with a halfway presentable man after too long on her own, and that was all it took. It, th there are just some things in here that I find so relatable. That, like, um, the book opens with a, um, what do you call it? A meeting, it's like a, like an AA meeting, sort of, but I don't, I don't really know what exactly it's for, but it's, you know, people who are struggling with addiction of some sort, and, um, Cassie meets a man there, and there's this thing about being able to share your trauma and, um, your issues with another person and, and to feel like they're understanding you, and that they're sharing back, and when they share back then you feel like, okay, you've both opened up and you can, you have this sort of open line of communication and that's really special, and if you haven't had that before or you haven't had it in a very long time, then it definitely feels more um, genuine and trustworthy. And so that's, I, I like what she says here about that, like, after too long on her own, that was all it took, really. Just, just somebody, somebody who isn't absolutely horrible, um, allowing her to open up about herself, and that's, yeah, it's simple, but it, it goes a long way, and sometimes that's not a good thing, you know, like, um, you gotta be careful, you gotta, you know, you gotta be able to open up, but you also have to be, have to understand that not everyone has your best interests at heart, and just because you feel like um, there's this good thing happening, you don't, you know, you don't really know for sure, but I definitely try to be hopeful and, um, and optimistic. Keep trying, you know what I mean? Um, so, she's forgotten how to talk, how to be yourself with someone else, how to not be on her own. She keeps waiting for him to see the darkness around her, inside her, and run, effing run, a million miles. Instead, he's lit something, a match, a candle, an emergency flare. Instead, he's cracked her open and let the light creep in. Um, that is very similar to the last thing that I was talking about. I think that's what we, a lot of us want, is to be able to show our darkness, but to let somebody, to let somebody in enough that they can find the light, that there is a light in us. Um, and I believe there is, there always is, but it can be very hard to find, especially if that light has been smothered over and over. Glass doors, glass walls, everything was transparent, so the ideas could see each other, could join up, mate, breed new ideas that were even better and bigger and more world-changing. I just like that image of, um, you know, a high-tech company and their office, uh, what that looks like. I just, it's gotta be glass. It's gotta be glass. I don't know why. Because Black Mirror says so. I. Yeah, it would be weird if it wasn't like a bunch of glass. 
I'm very into the uh, typical sci-fi tropes um, and cliches, I guess. I don't know. It was interesting reading this because I could, I kind of felt like um, I could picture a lot of this setting because it never says that it's in Edinburgh, but I just, you know, I'm like, I know who wrote it and I could, you know, I could use my own understanding of the city and um, things that sounded familiar, like the university square that she talks about. And I was just picturing it's my university. So I don't know if it really is, but it's, um, it's cool to have an image in your head. One more, I think. An agreement made without words, made with a raise of Morgan's chin, with a narrowing of her eyes, as if towards a shaft of light that fell, unexpected, from what had seemed a solid wall, and turned out to be a door. I love that. I love the idea of um, things not always being what they seem, and so often we have to change our, our perspective, the way that we look at something. Um, and then it's sort of like, there is this like light bulb, you know, the, that silly image of the light bulb um, that turns on over your head and you're like a little cartoon person with a light bulb on your head. You know what I mean? It's, it's a way to kind of, I don't know if I want to say trick our brain into understanding things differently, but we definitely, I think we're always tricking our brain in one way or another or else none of us would really be, you know, okay, or as okay as we think we are. I'm very contemplative today. Um, so, yeah, bear with me. Um, so, something I thought about when I was reading this book is how I, myself, want to be able to write science fiction. Like, I have this whole idea semi-mapped out in my head for a trilogy that I want to write, and at the same time I'm kind of afraid because it seems when I do try to write science fiction it does get really cliche, and um, I don't necessarily want to get into so much specifics of technology or, um, I don't know, I think I'm kind of interested in more dystopian kind of literature, like where things have changed but they look like they look so much the same and it's more people's attitudes that have changed and I don't know I'm kind of thinking of like The Handmaid's Tale I guess um just society has changed or something I don't know but that being said I'm also like super interested in space travel and um and technology so but you know now that Black Mirror has happened it feels like everything has been done I mean that show is so good and even, even on Black Mirror, they have had to reuse certain ideas, and at a certain point it gets a little tedious, like, like they've run out, and that's so sad because it's such a brilliant show. Um, and I just would never presume to think that my writing could come close to something that original. Um, but yeah, I, I'm very interested in, in sci-fi, and um, I grew up kind of influenced a lot by those stories and I read a lot of um, young adult or like children's literature that was science fiction but as an adult I haven't really read very much and I'd like to change that but the problem is I'm so interested in um, character studies very human stories very introspective it's all you know thought based and there's like almost no action that's the kind of story that I like and it's the kind of thing that I like to write so it can be difficult to find um, genre fiction, if you will, that kind of matches with that. Um, but then that's a stereotype as well, that genre fiction like sci-fi and fantasy can't also have these uh, literary fiction elements. Um, so, I don't know, I think that's kind of all I have to say about it right now. I'm just very um, thoughtful about about all of that, you know, having almost finished this master's degree in creative writing and still not really being sure what I'm capable of and if I can write anything other than literary fiction um, is my dissertation is uh, kind of dystopian 
Um, I don't really want to call it sci-fi because I'm not quite sure where the story's going yet, but it could be. Um, more dystopian though. It's definitely set um, at a, a near point in the future. And But I just don't want it to get bogged down by that, you know, I still want it to have a very um, immediate, important human element that is relatable um, to what people can, um, what people are going through now. So, yeah, I have to finish writing that and editing it and have to submit it by August something. And I thought for sure I would have it all done this month. Uh, is it still May? Yes. I would just write the whole thing in May and then it would be great. And I'm coming to realize with the help of Jane Alexander, who wrote this book, um, who is, uh, you know, meeting with me over Zoom, uh, for my dissertation. With her help I'm realizing that it's going to be a lot more work than I thought and that's fine because to hone any craft that you are working on, you know, whether it's playing an instrument or being really good at baking um, or writing stories, it, it takes a lot of practice and I'm finding that it, it, it helps to keep putting things out there and, and keep submitting things and getting rejections because one day it might not be a rejection. And that's, you know, all we can do is hope for that day and, you know, keep enjoying what we do as writers. So yeah, this is definitely a, a challenging task for me because I have to keep the dissertation to 20,000 words max. And I personally only wrote novels in the past um, or full length memoir and going from, you know, like 70 to 100,000 words down to 20,000 words and trying to make, you know, a concise, interesting, rich in detail story without it being, you know, a piece of like flash fiction, which I'm working on right now, like writing things under a thousand words. It's this weird middle ground and, um, it is uh, gonna be an, a very interesting limit to work with, but I plan to use this as sort of a blueprint, if you will, for a future novel. So I, I want this story to be able to stand on its own. Obviously it's my dissertation, I'm going to submit it for a grade, um, but I would like it to be full length eventually. So here I go doing this whole writer thing and, and, you know, trying to make something out of it. Not always easy, but I guess this is uh, what I've chosen to do, so I'm gonna stick to it. So thanks for watching, and I hope to come back next week with something else. Uh, the problem is I am having a really hard time balancing reading and writing. <laughs> Some of you are probably familiar with this. I really just want to read, like I'm already looking at all of these books and trying to pick out uh, which ones I want to read. I know some of you voted on my um, Instagram stories, which, like, which ones should I read next, like, between Pride and Prejudice and Northanger Abbey, stuff like that. Um, and I just want to read them all at once, and, you know, there's, like, too many of them to read all at once. And I also have to write a dissertation and submit two other things, and... Uh, so, a lot going on in here, in addition to, you know, personal stuff, and... Uh, we all have to find a balance somehow, and I am doing my best right now. So thanks for sticking around. I'll see you guys next time.